Okay, let's start. Let me introduce you to Dagenings Morgrave, a security officer in FreeBSD and working for the security team in the University of Oslo. Thank you. Um, so, as uh, Olivier said, I am um, employed at the University of Oslo in uh, Norway, uh, where I work in the security team. And for the last two years, I was also a developer on the TSD project, which is what I uh, would like to talk to you about uh, today. I've also been a FreeBSD developer for um, more than 15 years, and I'm currently the security officer. So, um, the title of the presentation is Securing Sensitive and Restricted Data. So I'm going to start by uh, defining what uh, sensitive and restricted data are. Um, and in uh, the context of a university, uh, these are um, genetic sequences, patient records, uh, responses to surveys, um, audiovisual recordings of patients and respondents, and anything you, you care to think about. So we have, in, in, um, in TSD currently, we have projects that uh, work on um, human genome uh, data, human genetic sequences for diagnostic purposes. We have um, we have uh, sociologists who uh, work on uh, on a research project regarding alcoholism, and they have um, uh, interviews with patients. Uh, we have psychologists who uh, work on a research project regarding the um, psychological effect of the uh, July 2011 bombing in in Oslo. So they have. Uh, recordings and, and video videos of uh, interviews with um, with victims and um, and next of kin, uh, things like that. Um, in most cases, these are you know the usual. These are personally identifiable uh, data. These are privacy issues. But in some cases, um, leaking those data could actually bring harm to the person. Uh, 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 in question, uh, we we might have. I don't think that we do at the time, but we might have, for instance, um, researchers uh, working with dissidents in uh, in the uh, Middle East or in Asia, um, where leaking information about their research might mean that somebody dies. In the worst case, so the law. Um, very. I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to explain this in detail, but uh, I, I can summarize this uh, as, as follows. Personally identifiable data, which is anything that may be connected to a specific person, uh, may only be, be collected and retained with the person's informed consent for a specific purpose for a specific length of time. And in um, the academic world, at least in Norway, the way this works is that a research group uh, that wishes to uh, to uh, collect um, a certain type of data, such as patient information or or whatever, first have to get approval from the uh, academic ethics review board uh, for their uh, research. Uh, then they have to get written consent from everybody involved. Um, they collect the data and the, the authorization that they get from the ethics board has a date limit uh, and a specifically stated purpose. And once that date limit is reached, the data must be destroyed. Um, so, the dilemma is that the data must be accessible to those who collected it. But thank you, Impress, for running the animation backwards. Uh, <laughs> the data must remain, uh, must be kept under lock and key. Uh, however, the data must also be accessible to those who collect it. That's the dilemma we face it. And we solve that by providing a fully functional working environment, which I will define later, within which the data is accessible, but from which it cannot be extracted, or at least cannot easily be extracted. 
So a fully functional working environment means A, storage. We're talking about data, so necessarily there must be storage. Databases for organizing that data, depending entirely depending on the type of data, of course. Some of our users require uh, relational databases. We uh, offer them uh, PostgreSQL. And uh, some require entirely different tools. Uh, we provide virtual Windows and Linux desktops uh, with uh, remote access. Uh, we provide the usual suite of uh, office software and scientific software. Uh, we have a, a standard package that includes things like BioPython, R. Um, we can provide MATLAB, Stata, SPSS, and other commercial software on demand, um, provided, of course, that they have licenses or they ac acquire licenses through us. Um, uh, and we also have a high-performance uh, computing cluster inside the TSD environment, which is separate from our... Um, uh, we, we have an HPC cluster, which is currently number 400 or something on the top 500 list. It was at n number 96 when it was built. But um, So... Um, once again, data. The data originates outside of TSD, and it must be brought in. And the results must be extracted again um, uh, in, in some sort. The, the only direct access that we provide to this um, walled garden is uh, as I mentioned earlier, virtual Windows and Linux desktops uh, with either RDP or SPICE as a graphical uh, remote desktop protocol. Um, and those are tunneled through SSH, and I will explain, um, I will describe this in a little more detail later. So we turn off all side channels in those protocols. We turn off the uh, clipboard, we turn off shared folders, uh, USB um, uh, tunneling, and other easily used side channels. Of course, uh, let me say this right away, because if I don't, inevitably somebody will, will <laughs> ask me about it at the end. We cannot, it is impossible to close all side channels. The only way to do that is to store the data on a disk, put the data in a bucket, fill the bucket with concrete, and bury it in the ground. Uh, at which point, we're back to our dilemma, it is not accessible, it needs to be accessible. So there will always be side channels. You can, you can, um, uh, you could, you can screen scrape the desktop com uh, uh, connection, you can uh, write um, an RDP client that uh, sends key presses to display the data and then scrapes it, and of course we have to draw the line somewhere. Um, we do. We make a best effort, and we make um, a certain number of assumptions about the uh, the users and about the attackers. Uh, we we will never be able to defend ourselves against uh, a truly determined adversary anyway. So we make a best effort. Um, so when data has to be transferred into the system, or results, or whatever have to be transferred out of the system. We use what we call a data lock in, in the same sense, lock here in the same sense as an airlock or a, a, a lock on a, on a river, um, which is, which is a, a pair of machines, which I will describe in slightly more detail uh, later, um, where the outward facing machine is an SFTP server and data can be deposited there and it will be copied into the system and likewise users within the system can move data into a specific area of the storage system from where it will be um, uh, uh, transferred copied to the SFTP server and they can uh, download it from there. Um, so a bird's eye view we have the big bad internet traditionally represented as a, as a as a cloud. So this is it's becoming a little bit confusing because the cloud is something else now. But anyway, uh, 
the big bad internet has uh, is a cloud as as is traditional, um, and we have two interfaces between the red zone between the world, the internet, and our green walled garden. One of them is the file lock that I just um, described, and the other is I've written jump host in singular here, but there are actually two jump hosts. They're redundant, and those are the jump hosts are the main. Uh, an entry point for users into the system. So, from the internet, from I could, I could access it from my laptop here, or from my uh, workstation at the uh, University of Oslo, or for, from my PC at home, or, or uh, wherever. Um, I can connect to the jump host to establish a tunnel, and then through that tunnel, I can connect to my virtual desktop. And depending on which uh, services my the research group to which I belong have um, uh, ordered and and uh, and paid for, I can get I can from that desktop I can access the um, high performance computing cluster. I can access databases, and of course I can always access the uh, storage system where a certain amount, um, however many terabytes you're willing to pay for have been reserved for the project. Um, the storage system is a segment of um, a system called AstraStore, which is a seven petabyte hierarchical, hierarchical sorry, um, storage system, which is split about evenly, I think three petabytes of disk and four petabytes of tape, or the other way around. Um, um, so it's a it's a segment of that system that has been set aside with a separate. Uh, it has its own um, head, if you're familiar with uh, storage terminology. So uh, there's a huge amount of block storage, and then there are uh, SIFs and uh, NFS uh, heads, uh, front ends that we communicate with. Um, right. Um, so let's uh, take a, uh, um, um, a closer look at the uh, network topology uh, that we um, see here. So we have two space heaters in the, um, in the server room. Um, one of them is a big Cisco box. The other one is a smaller Cisco box. They're our main routers. So what I haven't shown, which is on off the screen here on the left, is the rest of the university network. and. Um, and the internet and the world. Um, and the uh, jump hosts are directly connected to the, to the routers. And the external half of the data lock is also directly connected to the routers. So these are accessible. They have public IP addresses, both uh, IPv4 and IPv6 addresses. Uh, and are uh, accept, uh, accessible from wherever, provided you have an account and credentials and everything. And on the inside, uh, the inside network is divided into separate, um, uh, quite a large number actually of, of VLANs and uh, subnets. Uh, we have a slash 48 IPv6 block that we use for everything, but uh, as I will um, uh, as I mentioned on a, a later slide, uh, there um, we've had a lot of trouble with um, IPv6, so we also have to use an RFC 1918 network on the inside, an IPv4 network. But the IPv4 network is uh, it's a private address space and it's not routed, whereas the IPv6 network is a public address is public address space and is partially routed. Um, uh, so that, for instance, machines on the inside can retrieve can uh, retrieve um, uh, security updates, uh, install software under within certain limits. Um, some of our machines need to be able to access licensed servers, which are on the outside. Some of them can be proxied, but some of them can't. Uh, things like that. So the the jump hosts and the external data lock are FreeBSD 10 machines. The inside of the data lock is uh, Linux. Most of the, the other stuff is either Linux or 
or Windows, uh, the Nexus, which I will describe later, is also a FreeBSD 10 machine. Um, Prism is... <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a Linux VM that sits... So we have a separate storage VLAN, and Prism is the only, uh, the only machine, the only VM in that VLAN, apart from the data lock that, you, that actually has. Uh, it, it's a management machine. We called it Prism because it can access all the data. It's the only, the, these two machines are the only ones that can access absolutely all the, the data in the system without, um, and they do it by being within the same VLAN. So everything is routed through the jump hosts. They have a dual role. They are both routers and firewalls and also login nodes. I'll get back to that later. Um, on the management VLAN here, we have, for instance, we have a domain controller. We actually have two, but one of them is physical, one of them is virtual. We have an authoritative name server, which um, is not used as resolver. The jump hosts run unbound with... Um, uh, they run unbound with multiple forwarders. Uh, so the our internal authoritative name server um, is used to resolve uh, um, our own DNS domain and they forward other requests to the university's uh, resolvers. Our DNS, DNS space is also exposed, by the way, to the world. It makes... We, we, we made a decision there. Uh, we made a, a judgment call and said that, well, um, it makes our lives much, much easier to have our DNS space be accessible, uh, and the risk is not really that high. So we, we, we chose to do that. Um, RevM is the uh, Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization Management Node, uh, which is um, uh, a separate, mo most of these, so the, the jump hosts and the external data lock are physical machines. Uh, most of the other uh, are, uh, other machines are, are virtual and they run on uh, Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization in a Dell Blade server. Uh, the management node is actually a separate physical blade for obvious reasons. We don't want to have the management node be a virtual machine. Um, the storage, obviously, is a rather large black box, literally huge black box. Um, and not a virtual machine. And um, note that this is a network topology map. So, of course, this large black box is not actually located in the same room and inside, etc. It's located in a different room. There are other uh, details that I've hidden there. There's uh, 10 gig fiber between... We actually use a built-in switch in the Blade Center. The, switch, the Blade Center has a built-in uh, built switch with a 40 gigabyte, uh, gigabit backplane, I think. And we have a 10 gig connection going from uh, the Blade Center to the uh, storage uh, facility and 10 gig connections going to the jump hosts and to the data lock. Um, uh, so the jump hosts have, as I mentioned, a dual role. They're routers fire slash firewalls, and they're also login nodes. So in hindsight, maybe in, in hindsight, this is one of the changes I, I uh, uh, one of the things I would have done differently and which we could actually probably still change uh, is to separate, uh, to, to, to split the uh, to have login nodes that are separate from the uh, from the routers and firewalls. Uh, the problem is that the login nodes have to have IPv4 addresses because they have to be reachable. Most of our users don't have IPv6. So they have to have IPv4 addresses. So we can't, I can't just fire up a couple of VMs inside TSD and designate them as login nodes because they won't be reachable. You'll have to use the login nodes to access the login nodes. Um, <sighs> So those are surmountable technical obstacles. They run FreeBSD 10, as I mentioned. They started out running 9.1, and over the course of two years, they've been upgraded to 9.2 and then 10. Um, 
10 was a huge relief. Um, there were many issues with, for instance, with CARP in FreeBSD 9 that are fixed in FreeBSD 10, and some of them are issues that I um, that I discovered and fixed in in the process of, of uh, developing this uh, system, and some of them are issues that, for instance, Gleb completely rewrote uh, CARP in uh, FreeBSD 10, and it's much, much, much uh, simpler to configure and, uh, and maintain now. Um, and the login uh, function is implemented with OpenSSH with two-factor authentication. I'll um, go into, um, I'll describe the um, uh, authentication system um, later. Um, right, multiplicity. There are uh, currently around 45 separate research projects. I'm not sure they're all active. I say around 45 because I know that the, so internally we have objects in our provisioning database that are ca called projects and the first 10 are reserved and we are currently at 55 or 56. So 55 or 56 minus 10 equals 45 or 46, but I don't know how many of those precisely are, are active or how many are reserved for future use. Or, but it's about that and we get new, um, we get new, there are a lot of people uh, from all over uh, the country because the University of Oslo is with 7,000 employees, 30 or 40,000 students, we're the largest in Norway and we provide um, services uh, to uh, other universities and, uh, and colleges. Um, and this is uh, a national service. Uh, we, we have people, uh, we have new applications almost daily or at least weekly and we've actually gotten to the point where we need to rethink the one project per VLAN model and where we're probably going to merge or to place smaller projects projects that have very small amounts of data and they to to place them on the same VLAN but with separate subnets. Uh, so we have a slightly lower level of security because if somebody managed to, manages to get root on one of the on a VM on one of the subnets on that VLAN they can of course change their network configuration or spoof and talk to other uh, machines on the same VLAN, but um, the point is that they must be kept separate. They must be protected from each other and to a certain extent from themselves, but from each other. So um, back to the network topology. Uh, I've removed the uh, Cisco space heaters um, and we have, uh, so we have the jump hosts here and a few more VLANs that I uh, didn't uh, mention earlier. We have a separate VLAN for Drax, uh, serial consoles for all the, all the uh, physical, um, all the, the, the actual hardware. Uh, the management VLAN and the storage VLAN were shown earlier. The hypervisor VLAN, the um, uh, Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization host nodes uh, are on a separate um, VLAN. Um, and we have project VLANs. We have a lot of project VLANs that are kept separate. So all traffic between each project and anything else in the system is routed through the jump host uh, and the jump hosts ca can monitor and control that traffic and we have a very fine-grained packet filter in place. Um, so I talked about the uh, login um, function. Uh, we have a <laughs> very complex uh, identity authentication authorization system, which is composed of multiple different, uh, I've written multiple provisioning systems there, but multiple IAA systems. We have um, a system, a provisioning system called Cerebrum, uh, which was originally designed as an IAA system, but it has grown to also, it's now also a, a machine database. We use that at the University of Oslo and several other universities in Norway use it as well, and colleges. So it's a database of 
person's users, those are distinct um, uh, concepts because a person can have multiple users associated with them. And machines, um, uh, not only machines, but also, uh, so it can generate our entire DNS zone file. Uh, it knows about machines and it can, uh, we can, we use it to assign IP addresses to machines, we use it to assign names to machines, C names, uh, PTR, uh, DNS records, um, and also roles because we can set, uh, we can assign uh, roles to machines uh, which are then exported as groups in the LDAP uh, directory. Um, which means that um, on the uh, at the other end we can uh, do an LDAP lookup. Uh, is this machine part of that group and if it is then this machine will have either automatically install this software or things like that. Um, Active Directory is used for identity and authentication internally, so Cerebrum is not something that you access directly. It's not like when you log in on a machine, it will ask Cerebrum for information about you. It's a, it's a database, and when you make a change in Cerebrum, it will push, uh, it will propagate that change to our uh, domain controllers or to our Active Directory, uh, and also to the Nexus, which I forgot to list there, but it was on the a network topology map. So the Nexus is, um, it grew out of, uh, we made the decision to use Cerebrum rather late. Uh, we were initially uh, going to have our own provisioning system. Um, and the remains of that provisioning system is Nexus, which is used specifically by the uh, two-factor authentication uh, system. Uh, and uh, also for uh, network configuration to a certain extent. Um, the second factor is handled by um, uh, a radius server, uh, which, uh, so Cerebrum, when you assign a, an OTP key to a user, it is uh, pushed to the Nexus, which delivers it to the, ra or places it in a pla place where the radius server will find it. And then, I'm getting ahead of my, myself. I have a slide for this. Um, here's the, uh, the entire, if anybody here actually knows and likes UML, I'm terribly, terribly sorry for my horrible abuse of a sequence diagram. Uh, but uh, anyway, um, so you, um, a, um, a TSD administrator or, or um, tech support person creates a user in Cerebrum. I will not go into all the political details. There is a lot of paperwork because we have to get a copy of the ethics board um, approval and everything before we will even create a project. I won't go into that. Um, so you create a user in Cerebrum and uh, that is immediately propagated to Active Directory and it is immediately propagated to Nexus. Then you set a password and that password is sent to Active Directory. It is not sent to Nexus. Nexus doesn't need to know the password. Then you set an OTP key, the secret for, uh, for an, uh, for an uh, OTP key, uh, which is then sent to Nexus. So at a later point, there should be an arrow here that says login or whatever. But at a later point, the user attempts to log in so we do an identity request from Active Directory, that's LDAP. Uh, then we ask the user for their, um, uh, for a, a one-time code, uh, which is then uh, uh, transmitted in a radius request to the radius server. And the radius server runs um, uh, a program that uh, retrieves the key from the Nexus uh, database and verifies it, and if it is correct, it will increment the counter or uh, to prevent uh, reuse. And then the OpenSSH verifies the password. That's actually a Kerberos um, request to the Active Directory server. And ah, this line was supposed to be there. 
then it updates the firewall. It, it uses AuthPF to insert user-specific rules into the uh, firewall rule set. And at a later point, uh, uh, at, at a later point, when the user eventually um, logs out, then auth the AuthPF process dies and the rules are uh, removed from the firewall. So here's uh, some of the things that we do with the provisioning system other than, um, other than um, user management. Um, when a machine is created in Cerebrum, a machine object is created in Cerebrum. So I type into my command prompt, uh, host add, host add, whatever. Um, and then I assign a role to it that says, uh, a role that's called uh, auto provision. I, I assign a role to it that says, for instance, Linux operating system. What happens is that within a few minutes, the um, there's a, a backend that will create a virtual machine in Rev and start the uh, installation. We use, I think, for Windows machines, Windows machines are cloned, I think. I'm not entirely sure because I haven't been uh, involved in the Windows side of things. And Linux machines are Pixie um, installed with Kickstarter. Um, Every machine in the database has a role, which is either a Linux operating system, Windows operating system, or FreeBSD operating system, so that in the LDAP directory, I can look up a group in LDAP called Linux operating system or Windows operating system, FreeBSD op operating system, whatever. That group will contain all, mach all the machines that run that operating system, at least in theory, if the information in the database is correct. And I can use that. Um, uh, there's a, a script that runs every, either every minute or every five minutes, something like that, that will uh, traverse the LDAP directory and look at specific groups in the LDAP directory and translate those groups into, uh, into PF address tables. So it looks up a group, for instance, Linux operating system, and it gets a list of, uh, it gets a, a list of machine names and then it looks up all the machine objects and gets the DNS hostname property from the machine object, resolves that, does a, a DNS lookup for that, and you end up with a long list of addresses and those are shoved into a PF table uh, which is um, uh, updated dynamically. So we have firewall rules based on those tables. For instance, um, we have a firewall rule that says that Linux machines and FreeBSD machines are allowed to talk to the CF Engine server for configuration management. But Windows machines aren't. They have no reason to talk to CF Engine. And I don't want somebody to log in on, a, on their Windows desktop, wherever, and start messing around with the, or try to mess around with the CF Engine server for whatever reason. Um, only Windows machines are allowed to talk to um, w, uh, do you know, uh, we, WSUS, the Windows um, um, software update system, for instance. Linux machines are allowed to talk to our YUM uh, proxy, which is a proxy for the Red Hat network for automatic updates. Our FreeBSD machines are allowed to talk to uh, the FreeBSD update and package uh, servers things like that. And that's updated dynamically. So you add a if you add a machine in Cerebrum, five minutes later, the machine is, at least for a Linux machine, is very fast. The machine is uh, uh, created, installed, and firewall rules have been updated for that machine. Users are affiliated with projects and machines. Actually, everything in the system is affiliated with a project. That's uh, one of the modifications we made to Cerebrum, uh, which means that uh, we can also modify the firewall rules or have firewall rules that are specific for groups of users. And um, that's something that uh, we haven't... It's on the to-do list, but it hasn't been implemented yet. But um, if a user on project 42 logs in, then the, auth, the, the rules that auth PF will install into the PF uh, rule set 
will only allow uh, will only allow uh, that user to access machines that belong to Project 42. Uh, right. Here's an example of the login process. It's not really very, uh, very interesting, but it's just you get a banner. You are connecting to the University of Oslo. Blah blah blah. Restricted to duly accredited members. So this is we had a lawyer who required us to print a banner before logging in, um, which is fine by me. Uh, I think the, the, the operative part here is that we had a research project from the Oslo University Hospital and their security people um, have restrictions on which machines that they are allowed to use to log into our system. So that's actually why we have that banner here. Um, one time code, password, blah. I am now logged in and what I get when I log in is uh, um, a um, screen full of text that describes how to use. Yes? Oh. Um, uh, describes how to use it. And of course, you don't get a shell because uh, your login shell is auth pf and your home directory is var empty. So uh, it just remains open until you control C or you lose the. Uh, network connection. So where the rubber meets the road, I've been, uh, I've, I've covered, I think, most of uh, how it's supposed to work. Uh, but we've had issues. There are always issues. TSD was intended to be an IPv6 only environment. Unfortunately, as we discovered, after a fairly short while, a lot of software does not support IPv6, still does not support IPv6, or they claim to support IPv6, but they don't do it properly. Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization does not support IPv6 at all. That was an eye-opener. And even, you can't even have IPv6 name servers in your resolve.conf on a Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization host node because they don't use the glibc DNS resolver. They have their own resolver which does not understand uh, an IPv6 uh, name server address in result.conf. Um, also, you can't uh, pixie boot over IPv6. There's an RFC for it, but it's not implemented. So the, the, the QMU BIOS, the, the BIOS in the pixie BIOS in the VMs doesn't talk IPv6. We can't use Slack, uh, which would have been very nice. I mean. Yes, Slack has limitations and issues and security issues, but we can't use it because Linux source address selection is broken. Uh, so we have to use CARP on the inside instead of um, using Slack for uh, router advertising. And also found and fixed some bugs in FreeBSD's RTADVD, uh, some crashes and things. Um, issues with PF and CARP. Uh, there was a bug in FreeBSD source address selection as well. So the backup, if you have, a, you have a master and a backup node, and they share an IP address, but the backup node is not supposed to use that IP address when it's the backup node, but it will still use that IP address as the source address for outgoing connections. Fix that. Um, we still have problems with uh, IPv6, routing of IPv6 UDP packets, and I think it's related to the fact that uh, uh, PF does some weird things with uh, checksums, and I know that the, the IPv6 the IPv4 code there is somewhat wrong, and the IPv6 code there is very wrong, but it will only manifest under, under certain circumstances, and apparently we trigger those. There's a PR for that that's assigned to me. I haven't. Our state, our state table uh, kept filling up, and I discovered that it was actually due to uh, DNS, NTP, Kerberos, LDAP requests. Boom. Like the script that populates the PF address tables. 2,000 states. The moment I run it, because it does individual LDAP requests, the moment I run it, I suddenly have two or 3,000 new entries in my state table. So my state table is now, has, now has a state table limit is now 100,000 states. Should be enough. Um. <laughs> 
Yeah, uh, IAA issues, so free radius is difficult to configure correctly. It's also slightly unreliable. There are weird things that happen when we add a user. Sometimes free radius insists that the user does not exist. So you get an invalid user. It doesn't even ask the backend. It doesn't even try to verify the code. It just, no, that user doesn't exist, even though the user has been in the uh, uh, etc spwd dot whatever for days. An SSL app is also slightly broken, and that's my fault. Um, it had a huge bug, and I fixed the huge bug, but when I fixed the huge bug, I introduced a small bug. And I'm out of time. I could go on for hours about all the things that don't work in TSD and all the things we should have done differently, but I'm out of time, so questions? Uh, wait for the microphone. Do you have a mechanism to uh, rate limit outgoing data transfer just to stop bulk export if there turns out to be a, a bug in your uh, implementation to stop um, the, the design of the system is to stop people bulk extracting the data for yeah yeah so do you have a mechanism to say rate limit uh, network throughputs for given connections to at least mitigate some of that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, do I have a mechanism to...? To, to rate limit, to, to stop the... Oh, rate limit, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, the... Uh, so when you export data, uh, at, some, at some level we have to trust our users. So we have, uh, we have uh, uh, groups with... Um, uh, uh, we have user roles as well. And initially only the... Uh, administrator and head of a project are allowed to export data. Um, and they do that by placing it in a specific directory and then it's copied from there to the SFTP server and they can download it from there. Uh, currently there's a, a flaw in that mechanism because it's limited to, I limited it to eight uh, con uh, simultaneous uh, transfers. So it, the, the system scans the directory and then it picks up new files and it starts transferring them, but it won't transfer more than eight files at a time. The problem, if, of course, is that if you have eight, eight huge files, like eight huge FASTA uh, files, uh, gene sequences, then nothing else gets transferred until they're done. So um, uh, yes, that's an issue. Um, but other than that, no, we... we we have to trust our users to a certain extent, and we choose to trust them there. Any other? Uh, what you're using for OTP exactly? Oh, you're using tokens, you're using SMS, or what is this? Um, RFC 6238, uh, time-based, one-time password. The same uh, same algorithm that Google uses. Um, so uh, users who have smartphones uh, can use free OTP uh, or the Google Authenticator app, but I prefer free OTP, which is uh, Red Hat's uh, version of the Google Authenticator app. Uh, users who don't have or don't want to have smartphones get a YubiKey instead, and so they get event mode instead of uh, time mode. So. <laughs> I uh, just wanted to ask uh, if your jump posts, are they independently or is there some load balancing between or have the users to explicitly choose one of the jump posts? Um, there's CARP both in front and behind. So the users are instructed to SSH to the jh.tsd.use.no, which is the CARP address and which will go to whichever is the, the master. Uh, so it's a failover mechanism, not a load balancing mechanism. Yeah. Uh, if I correctly understand, the users have to connect to a desktop, which is inside the perimeter, yeah. so they can access the data from there. So are there some way to prevent the users exporting the data from their desktops outside uh, using some DOP? Because you mentioned that uh, the files are already uh, using uh, SHA 256, so using DOP with this information sounds quite easy. Uh, using? DOP, data leak prevention tools, because... Uh, well, um, so, uh, first of all, they, uh, they get a remote desktop, but they can't copy-paste out of that desktop, right? They have to use the file lock to send data out, and all accesses are logged. So. 
this is a case, so we're back to what I said earlier, we have to trust our users, but there are, there's also, from a legal point of view, there's a point where our job is no longer to prevent data from moving around, but to be able to document that the data has moved around. Um, and this is, uh, this is what, what the checksum is for. We log the file name, the user, a timestamp, and a checksum, uh, checksum, checksum of the file. Um, and we, we have, I mean, the system is useless if, we, if our users aren't allowed to extract the data at all. So it's, yeah, it's a difficult, uh, I hope I answered your question. Yeah. Yeah. How uh, easy is it to leverage your implementation for other sites, like other supercomputer sites at universities that have got similar uh, requirements? Uh, yeah, so it's a huge system, really a huge system. It's not, it's not really a product, but there are components that can be reused, and we know that there are other, uh, other institutions such as the um, Kunglia Techniska Högskolen, uh, the Royal Technical College in uh, Lund, who are implementing a similar system, and they've uh, expressed interest in our uh, file lock implementation. And that's actually that's a self-contained piece of software that, if if you have the need to copy data from A to B and log it, etc., that's software that you can actually build, and it, it's written under a BSD license, but I don't think the Git repo is accessible currently. Uh, so I just have to move it to a different Git repo. Um, the OTP code is something that I wrote myself. It's, um, it's still experimental, sort of. Uh, it's in the OpenPAM uh, SVN repo. Uh, when I, when I initially wrote it two years ago, there were no other BSD license OTP implementation except for a command line based one for a BSD, uh, OpenBSD's authentication framework, I don't remember what it's called. Um, now there are plenty, but yeah. Last question. Uh, how usable for end users is connection to SSH and making a local port mapping. Do you have some third-party uh, utility for everyone, like Mac users, Windows users, which use something like uh, P-Link to, uh, to do this? Uh, we, um, are, we document how to set up PuTTY, okay. basically. <laughs> so there, unfortunately, um, so this screen documents how to use SSH. Unfortunately, uh, there is no way you can't distribute a uh, so PuTTY does not have a file-based configuration. We would have no; uh, the, it uses a registry, so we would have to distribute pre-generated files that install registry keys dot, dot what is it dot reg files that install registry keys to configure PuTTY. So we instead we just tell people how to do it, and most of them manage to figure it out. So the question, yeah, the question was uh, batch files with peeling. Can we use that instead? Uh, I haven't looked into it. Uh, I th think that somebody looked into it and decided that it wasn't uh, as simple. So there is the two-factor thing. Um, I'm not entirely sure of why we chose not to do that. We did look into other SSH implementations than PuTTY, but we end up with PuTTY. It's, it's not really difficult to configure. So, yeah. Okay, thank you very much.